everyone. Uh, thank you for, for coming to this, uh, what is ready to be an amazing conversation uh, about recovery colleges. We're joined today um, by some folks from Ontario Shores and as well from Ontario Tech University. Um, I, I'll give you all the, the chance to uh, introduce yourselves in a sec, but um, uh, my name is Taylor. I use they, them pronouns, and I am from the Center for Innovation in Campus Mental Health. Um, and this uh, webinar is being co-hosted by myself and my colleague, uh, Emily Ann. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Ann. I go by she and her pronouns, and I'll be facilitating the Q&A at the end of the uh, portion. Actually, this is probably a good time to say um, for the q and I want to direct your attention to the bottom of your screens. Um, there is a Q&A portion. There is a Q&A button at the bottom. So if you could use that to direct your questions to the panelists, um, and then we'll be collecting those throughout. Yeah. So um, thank you so much again. And without further ado, let's uh, let's jump into it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'll just share my screen. So maybe I'll just uh, give us all a quick opportunity to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Holly Harris. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am a post-secondary peer support specialist here at Ontario Shore Center for Mental Health Sciences over in Whitby. Um, and I have the amazing opportunity to um, be part of the initiative to bring recovery colleges into the post-secondary space. So I'm really happy to be here and excited to engage in this conversation. And maybe I'll turn it over to my colleague, Julia, just do a quick introduction. Yeah, thank you, Holly. So my name is Julia Houston. I use the pronoun she, her. Um, I am also a post-secondary peer support specialist over at Ontario Shores Center for Mental Health Sciences here in Whitby. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here with all of you today, answer any questions you may have, and really just get the word out about this amazing initiative that um, we've all been working on. So thank you. Wonderful. And I'll turn it over to my friend, Hallie. Hi, everyone. My Hi. name is Hallie. I use she, her pronouns. I am a student at Ontario Tech University, and I have been a student as well as a recent co-facilitator for the Ontario um, Shores um, Recovery College courses, and I'm very excited to be able to share my story later on in the presentation. Thanks, Hallie and Bonnie. Hi everyone, my name is Bonnie Fedota. I use uh, she and her pronouns and I work with Ontario Tech University in student mental health services. My role is student wellness coordinator and I've been lucky enough to collaborate uh, with Ontario Shore Center for Mental Health Sciences. The Recovery College program has been with us since September 2020 and planning before that. And um, yeah, just work collaboratively with everyone that you've heard from. So happy to be here to answer any questions and to support the presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So let's dive in. Um, we are really excited to be here to talk to you today about the post-secondary recovery college movement. And maybe we'll start with really what does this word recovery mean? And often when we hear the word recovery, we think of clinical recovery. Um, so the things that may come to mind are remission of symptoms, return to baseline. Um, and this has been pretty common throughout the history of mental health is this is where people's minds go. But there's been a movement that emerged from the voices of consumer survivors, ex-patients, that they demanded more than clinical treatment, um, more than clinical care, more than clinical recovery. Um, because clinical recovery is contingent on diagnosis, it can only be influenced by a clinician. But on the other hand, personal recovery is possible and applicable to everyone. It's about living a purposeful and meaningful life, despite the presence of mental distress, which we all experience at some time or another, no matter how frequent or severe. Um, it's possible for everyone. It's a personal journey of discovery. It involves making sense of and finding meaning in what has happened, becoming an expert in your own self-care, building a new sense of purpose and meaning in life, and discovering your own resourcefulness and possibilities and using these uh, and the resources available to you to pursue your aspirations and goals. It's an individual journey that we're all on. It's non-linear, it's a journey, it's not a destination, and it's something I'm really, really passionate about um, and has been something that's been really influential for me in terms of my wellness journey. So really excited to come here and talk to you about it today. Um, 
So when we think about personal recovery, um, there was a study done that asked people who identified as being on a personal recovery journey, what's important to you in living this purposeful, meaningful life? And five facets came out of those conversations. The first one is connection. And when we think of connection, yes, it's connection to our community, our support networks, um, the people and roles that are important to us in our lives, but it's also about that connection to yourself um, and that self-compassion. It's about hope, recognizing that life isn't always sunshine and rainbows and unicorns, and I wish it was, but it's not. But really what hope means to me is recognizing that you will weather the storm and that you have the capacity to cope. Um, it's about identity. So maximizing who you are and really being rooted there. It's about meaning. And this has two meanings for me. Meaning in terms of making meaning outside of our mental distress and not letting that define us but also recognizing that our experiences navigating wellness are sources of strength and expertise and resilience and shared humanity and not sources of shame. It's recognizing that we can make meanings out of these experiences and leverage them in ways that will help us pursue our goals. And again, empowerment. These are the things that are really important in pursuing this purposeful, meaningful life. And this is a shift that has happened in the mental health system. Yes, clinical care is important, but it has to be coupled with these things. Um, so, it's something, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about and really drives this amazing programming that we're here to talk to you about today, which is the Recovery College, which is a program that has been created in response to the demand for more personal recovery oriented care. Over to my friend, Julia. Awesome. So what is a recovery college? Um, a recovery college is a low barrier, peer driven and strength based mental health and well-being learning center. Um, recovery colleges really aim to provide educational opportunities on a range of topics that really support positive mental well-being. Um, everyone has days where they're mentally not feeling great. The recovery college is really about helping find ways to live a purposeful and meaningful life despite the presence of mental distress, no matter how frequent or severe. We are all navigating wellness, which makes this programming applicable to absolutely anyone. It's transdiagnostic, it's inclusive, and, can, and it can really help anyone achieve their self-identified wellness goals. Um, we offer courses on a range of topics, so some include things on self-discovery, skill development, leisure and wellness, vocational support, learning about mental health treatment options, etc. Um, and one really great core feature of recovery colleges is that everything is co-produced between those with lived experience of mental, mental health challenges, so experts by experience, and those with professional experience. Um, like I said before, recovery colleges are inclusive and open to absolutely anyone. Um, they operate under the principles of the CHIME framework, which Holly just lovely explained, so connection, hope, identity, meaning, and empowerment. Um, and they aim to create a welcoming and stigma-free environment to promote feelings of community where indiv individuals can come in and form ongoing meaningful connections. Um, and recovery colleges aim to complement but do not replace clinical treatments of mental distress. Awesome, we love the Zoom leg. Um, so origins of the post-secondary recovery college movement. How did this come to be? Um, recovery colleges are typically found in tertiary mental health hospitals. Um, so the implementation of recovery colleges in the post-secondary context, context is a really novel initiative. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, mental health challenges were of epidemic proportions prior to the pandemic. And Ontario Tech University came to us as we had existing partnerships really concerned about some unmet needs with regards to students' mental health and well being. And then the pandemic hit, which only further exacerbated this situation. And through discussions with Ontario Tech, it appeared that implementing a recovery college really seemed to fit the gaps in, ter in terms of students' mental health and their needs. Um, and once we implemented at Ontario Tech, this type of programming was really not a hard sell for other schools as well. Um, yeah, these issues that students are having is not just um, only at Ontario Tech, it's clearly ac across um, many post-secondary institutions. And I'll turn it over to Bonnie now to talk a little bit more about Ontario Tech's Recovery College. Yeah, so as Julia mentioned, um, Ontario Tech, our student mental health services reached out to Ontario Shores as part of an application to one of the CICMH grants, partnership grants, 
uh, in order to meet the demands um, that uh, they were really our, our mental health team is consistently struggling to meet the needs of students. I'm sure many of you can relate to that. We had a staff of uh, five and then when I joined we had a staff of six in 2020 and during those busy periods I'm sure many of you know like midterm time um, the wait lists were just really long. Um, they're a little bit better now um, now that we're expanding our staff and expanding our partnerships. So uh, really Ontario Ontario Tech uh, reached out in order to enhance the services that we can offer to students. So we still have our five counselors working with students, but in addition, we were, we are able to offer mental health groups and Recovery College is one of the mental health groups. And the benefit is that this is a peer group, right? So it's facilitated by peer support specialists. It enhances our current peer programs. So we have student um, peer mentors and Hallie is one of those this year that work with students, but this is a nice complement to our peer program where we have professionals, professional peer support specialists as well coming in to work with our students and to, to help us fill the gaps in service. One of the groups, for example, that we will get into more details, one of the groups that we offered was um, related to support for worry and anxiety in particular during the pandemic. And we didn't have a group that specifically addressed that concern, which is the most common concern that we have with students is worry, anxiety. So yeah, so we're meeting additional needs and providing complementary support to the counseling that we offer in the other uh, couple of groups that we were offering. So yeah, so that's sort of how we came in. We can go to the next slide. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Bonnie. And Ontario Shores has been committed to recovery and this personal recovery movement. It's actually in our tagline, Discovery, Recovery, Hope. Um, we launched the first, um, mental health focused recovery college in Canada in 2016. And it's been an amazing journey. And since then we've leveraged this experience to partner with CMHA to develop over 20 recovery colleges. And then we really got thinking, given that personal recovery is applicable to everyone um, and everyone is navigating wellness, we thought we could implement this in non-traditional settings, not only in mental health um, organizations and institutions. So we've been exploring other avenues to implement this in non-traditional settings. And one of those is the post-secondary space. So you might be wondering, this sounds great, but how do we do it? So we have a very robust process. And one of my favorite things about the Recovery College, Julie and I are like very recent grads, like we literally graduated like two months ago. And um, we are just so passionate about highlighting the student's voice in this programming. So often in mental health and in uh, the post-secondary space, sometimes things are top down in nature. Things are done for students. Um, and sometimes it hits the mark and sometimes it doesn't. But by coupling this professional knowledge, this academic knowledge and this lived experience, we can create something really robust, really meaningful and really impactful. We can hit the mark. We don't make any assumptions. So this process, the student voice is at the center of every step. So first we do a mental health needs assessment. So we go to service providers at the school. We go to the students and ask, where are the gaps? What do we need? And then we take these ideas and we move into a co-production process. So when we first started, it was a co-production event where we took these ideas to students and say, okay, here's what we've heard. Um, if you were going to create some courses to address this need, what would they look like? If you could have your dream course, what would that look like? And then we would go away, Julia and I still as students would create these courses and bring them back and say, is this representative of our, of our conversation? Does this meet the need? And often always the answer was yes, but they had some really cool ways to tweak and tailor it. Um, but also this process has evolved. We've been doing this for about a year now and we started with an event and then a member checking event. But now we have a full co-designed course where we involve the students in that nitty gritty process of fleshing out each and every learning objective for each and every session of the courses. What guest speakers do we wanna have? What activities do we want to do? All of these things. Um, again, the courses are peer led. So Julia and I um, often start at schools facilitating, but then we bring in awesome people like Hallie and we train students who who's this programming is by and for to have meaningful employment opportunities in this space. Um, we have a really robust uh, training process that was co-designed by students who practice peer support in other settings and recovery college peers. It's a one and a half day training program um, because we want this to be a really awesome opportunity for students. Um, so we do that. 
And then we evaluate um, the, the programming and see how can we tweak and tailor to make it increasingly relevant and impactful. And we run the co-production process twice a year to make sure that the courses are representative of the current needs of students. And I'm sure as you can imagine, it's been very dynamic over the past uh, pandemic year. So um, we just wanna make sure we're responding to the current needs of students. And um, this is actually a graphic depiction of one of our co-design events. Um, so we have a graphic facilitator come and take a visual depiction of the conversation and the students feel really heard and validated. And this is also used for promotion to highlight to other students that this was designed by your peers. Um, and when you, when you say that, the walls come right down and people want to engage. They're like, okay, this is going to meet the need. Um, and it's been really interesting. This was one of our first co-design graphics, and it's been interesting to see the evolution of this programming over the past year. Um, at schools, when we first engage, they often want to learn about worry and anxiety and stress and those types of things. And then it transitions into a bit of a self-discovery space. And now we're seeing that recreation and leisure as well coming through, which is really interesting. Um, nothing magical happens when we turn 18 that says our hobbies and interests in play doesn't matter anymore. So students want to get back to that. Um, so these are just some visual depictions of our um, co-design processes. And again, um, we're able to run a five-week course right now where we engage students to meaningfully influence this programming, which is such an amazing um, opportunity. Um, okay, so I will turn it over to Julia to tell uh, us a little bit about the courses that we're going to be running next semester at Ontario Tech, just to give you an idea of what this programming looks like. Yeah, so students had so many wonderful ideas um, in that co-design course. Unfortunately, we only had room to run three courses. Um, so one of the courses we're running next semester is We to Wellness 2.0, uh, Tackling Worry. So they gave the name a little bit of an update. Um, and this course is really about managing anxiety and students wanted to update this to ensure that the content was still relevant and impactful for students. Um, so in this course, students really wanted to learn about what anxiety is, what it feels like, um, strategies to manage anxiety, navigating resources both on and off campus, um, overcoming stigma, um, and also anxiety related to the pandemic and how to cope with that. Um, it's constantly changing, right? Um, we're now going into a new normal, so it's hard to kind of cope with that. So managing our feelings and anxieties around that going back to the new normal. Uh, next slide. And oh, there we go. The next course is Let's Talk About It 2.0, Managing Wellness. Um, so students updated this course as well. So this course is really about stress management and managing our wellness. So they wanted to talk about the fact that this stage in our lives is overwhelming as post-secondary students. They wanted a space where they could recognize that they are not alone and they are not powerless against these stressful experiences. They wanted to share practical strategies with one another and create a community where they could prioritize their own wellness. And then this is our brand new course, our book club, Wellness Through Words. Um, we are so excited about this. Um, this is really showing that shift in courses to more the recreational and leisure based courses, which is super exciting. Um, in this course, students really wanted to bring back the power of reading for pleasure, which is something we just often forget to do as post-secondary students, even if it was one of our hobbies we really enjoyed prior to getting into the post-secondary context. Um, by reigniting our hobbies and interests outside of our academics, we'll be able to foster connections and habits that will really sustain us throughout our lifetime. So those were some of the courses at Ontario Tech and Ontario Tech was the first university ever to implement a recovery college that was designed for students by students, um, which is so amazing. And since then, we have now expanded to four other post-secondary institutions, um, both colleges and universities. Um, so McMaster has their peer-to-peer -peer well-being learning hub. Uh, George Brown College has their community club. Durham College has the MIND program, and these all function on the Recovery College model. And then University of Toronto Scarborough campus and Ontario Tech University have their recovery colleges. Um, and really, this is just a snapshot of our registrations at each of our five schools this semester. Um, we are thrilled that we've reached 208 registrations this semester. Holly and I were very excited when we passed the 200 mark. 
Um, and this really just keeps growing, which is amazing. We offer rolling registration at each school as well. That way students can sign up for courses throughout the semester. So we've gotten some halfway through the semester where students start to hear about the programming more and more, or they hear from a friend about their experiences in the recovery college and they wanna sign up. So yeah, this really just keeps growing and we're so excited to see where it goes. All right, thank you so much. So um, as you can tell, this programming is um, really innovative and it's a new approach. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the impact that we've been seeing, it's brand new. Um, so we really understand, I wanna understand um, who's gravitating towards this movement? Who is it helping? Is it helping and how so? Um, I know Julia and Hallie and I, we see the impact of this programming every day. Um, and so we have an evaluation strategy that we can use to demonstrate that. So there, we're thinking about a three phase approach. It's called a realist evaluation. And what we're starting to do um, in these first couple of semesters is really exploring who's gravitating towards um, this programming and really understand the, the, this model in a new context. So it's very exploratory. And then as we move forward, we're gonna really look at the individual impact that this is having on individuals who are attending courses or engaging with these communities. Um, and then eventually, hopefully looking at system level impact. I really think that um, one thing I hear all the time is that recovery colleges are system disruptors. They are um, novel and innovative approaches that really highlight the voices of those with lived experience. So um, like in, in the conversations that we have, we see culture shift. We see ideas change and people's minds change and open up to this new type of programming. So I really look forward to in the future being able to explore that on a systemic level. Um, so I'll just briefly share some of the things that we've heard so far. Um, so at um, Ontario Tech, we've run, I think we're in our fourth semester, um, McMaster and UTSC, we're in our second semester, and George Brown and Durham College, we're in our first semester. So this is very new. Um, so these are some of the things that we've been seeing. Um, there's relatively an even distribution across years of study for students, which is really interesting. And um, the things that students are um, seeking when they come to the recovery college are um, materials related to um, addressing struggles with academic stress, mental health stress, stress about COVID and family stressors. And you see these themes reflected in the courses that are being designed by students. Um, it's really interesting that some students who access the uh, recovery college, um, have, they they indicate that they have good mental health, some indicate that they have fair or poor. And one of the things that's really come to light recently um, through our engagement in this community is lots of peer support. Um, and there's tons of peer support going on in the post-secondary space. A lot of it is um, reactive in nature. So if a student has a problem, they'll seek out these services. What I love about the recovery college and the gap I think it fills is it can be used to pursue, maintain, or recover wellness. It's also proactive in nature, which is really, really amazing. Um, and people come for a variety of reasons. In terms of um, the reasons people are coming, we ask them, what does living a purposeful, meaningful life look like to you? And this is actually a word cloud created by students. These are some of the things that they're seeking. And in terms of preliminary results, they've been very, very promising. So we saw a significant improvement in self-reported emotional and mental health um, in using our pre-post design. Um, approximately 90% of students indicated that, that they learned something new that would help their mental health. And every single student um, indicated an interest in taking future courses. And we often think about um, this programming and why people gravitate towards it. And my sense is that Yes, people are coming to learn things and prioritize um, wellness and invest in themselves, yes. But also one of the huge pieces of this is community. People looking to make those connections with their community and talk about things that are often hush-hush and um, really recognize that their experiences don't have to be experiences of shame, but can be experiences of shared humanity and that they're not alone. So obviously there's impact from bums and seats in the courses, which is really wonderful. 
but um, we talk about the impact of the colleges themselves, but there's also a huge impact of this movement. Um, so we've been able to establish a post-secondary recovery college community of learning, where we bring together students, administrators, frontline service providers working in post-secondary researchers to really understand how we want to progress this movement forward. Um, and this was all co-designed. So we had a retreat where we designed what this community was going to look like and what we wanted to address. Um, so we meet every semester to talk about how we can further prioritize the student voice and progress this movement forward. We've also been able to create a post-secondary recovery called Research Consortium, where we can explore the impact of this programming. We've been able in the past year across our schools to create six meaningful employment opportunities for students to become facilitators in their college, which is amazing. Um, and you'll he'll hear a little bit from Hallie later about uh, how this experience has been for her. Um, another thing that we're looking at exploring right now is micro-credentialing opportunities. We recognize that students are getting so many skills out of their engagement in this programming, and they should be recognized for those. So we are exploring um, an opportunity with Ontario Tech and TD to create a micro-credentialing system where students can self-identify the skills that they get out of the recovery college um, and get recognized for it. So through a process of demonstrating how what skills that they feel that they have learned, um, they can be recognized for these skills and given a badge that they can put on their resume and that they can put on their LinkedIn and things like that. So they can be recognized for the skills that they're gaining. Um, I will turn it over to Julia to share some of the stories. So stories are really at the heart of the recovery college. Um, this programming is discussion-based, it's activity-based, it's community-based. Um, so we think it's really important to highlight the stories as well. So over to you, Julia. Awesome. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, Holly, myself, and Hallie, as peer facilitators, we hear so many stories from students um, about how the Recovery College has impacted them. Um, so we really just wanted to take some time to share some of these stories with you to really highlight how this is impacting students. Um, one story I can think of, um, I ran a session on advocacy and self-advocacy. Um, and the next week we were talking about what our main takeaways were from that session. What did we learn from that session? What did we like? Um, and I had one student indicate that she loved that session so much and thought it was so relevant and wished that she had known what self-advocacy was, how she could advocate for herself at a young age, that she actually took the slides and went through the slides with her daughter outside of class. Um, we send out the slides every week after the session. So she took those slides and taught self-advocacy her to her daughter, um, which really just shows that the reach of this can go beyond just the students that attend the sessions. These students take the learnings from these sessions, apply them to their life and can teach other people, their kids, families, friends. Um, it's really great. Another story I can think of is I also facilitated a session on resiliency. Um, and the next week, again, we we're talking about our main takeaway from that session. And one student indicated that she was not able to attend the session in person, but she did get the slides and she went through them herself and she found them so, so helpful. Um, she then opened up about how she experiences depression. And typically when she gets into these depressive states, they last um, quite a long time, two to three months. She said that she got these slides, worked through them herself, um, and that was the shortest amount of time she spent in that depressive state. And the next week she was feeling so much better. Um, it was so nice to hear. And I think it just shows that even if students can't come to the in-person session, we're sending out those slides and they can still engage with the Recovery College content, do their own self-learning um, and still get something very impactful out of it. And I'll turn it over to Holly again to tell some of her stories. Yeah. Um, I, I think back to when we ran our first co-design course, and this was a really um, interesting process because students wanted to be involved in that nitty gritty process of fleshing out each and every detail. Wa they wanted their voice in every aspect, which was really exciting. Um, so when we wrapped up our first co-design course, we, we sat with the students and we asked them like, what was this experience like for you? And here are some of the things we heard. It's been great. I've used Recovery College courses and they've helped me a lot. Um, this is my first time with the Recovery College and I signed up at the Get Involved Fair. It has been so cool to work behind the scenes and I'm so proud of us. This is something we hear all the time. Like students come, they create these courses and they are so proud. I had one student who we were talking to and they were telling their friends like, look what I created. It's amazing. Um, 
they find it really fun. They said, it's been so fun. I'm so sad it's ending, but I'm looking forward to the courses. So the students who design the courses, they want to come take them. Um, and they tell all their friends and bring them too. Um, another student said, this is my first year and first year has been really, really scary, but I'm just so grateful for the safe space that, that, is, that this has been. Um, so that is really impactful that students are feeling heard. And we hear that all the time. Students often feel like they're not heard or listened to by, by these structures, by the mental health system, by the post-secondary system. This space, students feel so heard. Um, I also think back to one of my first uh, sessions out of school and um, just the, the community that this fosters is so powerful. And I often say like Hallie, um, Julie and I, like we don't have all the answers. Like when I um, talk about peer support, I say peer support is about being an expert and not being an expert. And that takes a lot of expertise. Our role is to not have all the answers, but to create spaces where students can learn from each other um, and engage in conversation and create community. That's our job. Um, so, and by having that intention, it creates space for really magical things to happen. So um, one of my first sessions, it said, thank you, Holly. Talking with you guys made my day today, truthfully. I'm usually very to myself because of anxiety and I'm afraid of social contact, but I'm starting to warm up and all of you seem like very loving and amazing people. All of you seem so wonderful. I have never felt so comfortable, especially this quickly either. I just know all of you are very strong. And then students um, mentioned that they wanted to connect outside of the group. So yes, they're making these connections in the group, but like I have students who wanna go and play Dungeons and Dragons together on the weekend and have Zoom calls outside of the sessions, which is really amazing. Um, so we're really, really proud of this work. And um, I'm so lucky to get to work with people like Bonnie and Hallie and Julia. And I'm gonna turn it over to Hallie now to uh, tell us a little bit about her experiences in this movement. Hi everyone, hello again. I just wanted to start by saying that I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all about my story and my experience within the Recovery College program. So I'm going to start off by uh, talking a little bit about me. Um, so again, my name is Hallie and I'm 22 years old. I have been at Ontario Tech University for five years now and I'm going into my last year of my Bachelor of Commerce program where I am majoring in human resources. So I am planning on graduating in April or May of next year. Um, in terms of my involvement within the Recovery College program, I had started taking courses as a student in January of this year, and I have been involved in many ways since. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of my experiences with uh, mental distress. So I have had experiences with generalized and social anxiety as well as some instances of depression. And I've always been shy really for as long as I can remember. But the symptoms of social anxiety as well as generalized anxiety had started to appear when I was beginning grade eight. At that time, my family had moved to a new town where we are living now. So I didn't really know anyone and I had to make new friends on my own, which was not easy. Um, I would get worried that I would be judged by other people. So that left me feeling really insecure and afraid to open up. And I put a lot of pressure on myself to do well in school. So completing assignments and tests were a nightmare. <laughs> and so when I moved to uh, high school, it had essentially gotten a little bit worse. And I developed really high expectations for myself, but it had gotten to the point where I would do anything I could to avoid any anxious situation. I didn't get involved in any social situations because I couldn't handle the thought of embarrassing myself and risking people not liking me. And I would completely start over assignments just because I didn't think it was good enough, which led me, which led to a really bad habit of procrastinating and avoiding schoolwork altogether, which I think all led to experiences of really low mood because I wasn't meeting social needs and I was feeling terrible about the fact that I wasn't being productive. And for many reasons, I had not talked to anyone about it until the end of high school. And that was when I finally talked to my parents about it and they encouraged me to talk with a doctor and my doctor had prescribed medication, which worked a little bit, but not very much. Um, I still didn't say anything because I thought, oh, it's okay, I'll, I'll get better eventually. So I was still experiencing my symptoms for a very long time after that. And I didn't actually get serious about taking care of my mental well-being until my fourth year of being at the university. After having instances of 
not being able to fully complete my exams because of anxiety and having some mishaps at my internship, I realized that I couldn't do I couldn't do it on my own and I, I really needed the extra help. So I started looking for resources to use and I was searching on the university's website for groups and in doing so it had led me to finding the recovered college courses. And I decided to sign up just to see what it was like, which I am very glad that I did because I loved it from the very first session and for so many reasons, which <laughs> brings me to my next slide. Um, so what I enjoyed about uh, in terms of taking the recovery college courses, I found that the topics that we talked about in the courses were so helpful because of the fact that they were so relatable to students like myself. I remember one week in the We to Wellness class that we had, we were learning about stigma, about what it was and the different types. And that class was really eye-opening to me because I didn't realize that I was being negatively affected by so many different types and how much stigma was really affecting me. I realized that I minimized what I was going through because I thought other people had it worse than I did. Um, I didn't seek help and I'd never talked to anyone about my mental distress because I was afraid that people would see or treat me differently or that I would be assigned a, a label. But knowing what I was doing really helped me in overcoming those obstacles. So I feel like Recovery College does such a great job of listening to the students and what they find useful when creating these courses. Um, I love taking the courses because I felt like the facilitators did a, a wonderful job of making students feel heard when we have discussions. I felt like what I said, my story, my perspective were all appreciated. They did a great job of creating a safe environment, one where you can feel safe to open up and be who you are with, while not being judged. I'm not the kind of person who opens up very easily. So the fact that I found that great space to speak my mind on these topics was, it meant so much to me. And I love the fact that I could be with a group of people who went or goes through experiences that I related to. I used to feel alone because I wasn't aware of anyone that I knew was going through any of the things that I was, that I did. And I felt like I couldn't really talk about those types of things with my friends or family because I thought they wouldn't understand, mainly because I didn't even understand what I was going through. So it was so comforting in knowing that I'm not the only one and that I didn't have to go through my journey alone. And there are things that really put things, um, they really put things in perspective for me. And I owe a lot of that to the other students and just by listening to their coping strategies and their stories, I learned so much for, about myself and learned of new strategies that I never thought of trying before. Um, next slide, please. And now I wanna talk about what I took away from being a student in the Recover College program. So one of the most important messages that I learned was that I was a worthwhile, that I, that I am a worthwhile investment, that sometimes it's necessary to take the time to take care of myself before that was not always the case for me. I was the kind of person that didn't know when to take a break or always put everyone else uh, first, even if it was at my own expense. So they really encouraged me to do things that benefit and improve myself. So now I'm taking that time for me and <laughs> I am loving it. Um, the courses have really helped me with um, seeking help was not a sign of weakness. In fact, I realized that it actually gave me strength and help me gain control in my life. That <laughs> they have really helped me change my perspective on things like on that. Um, I learned of the many resources that was available to, in the community and in the university that I was never aware of and they are still helping me to this day with. Um, through the curriculum and the wonderful students that attended the classes, I have been able to gain a better understanding of what I experienced and what I feel. And with that, I feel like I'm now better equipped to handle those moments of anxiety and low moods. And I think it's great the fact that I get to pass on that, um, that knowledge to people in um, the new space. Um, next slide, please. And in the September of this year, I was very fortunate enough to obtain a position with the Student Mental Health Services Department at Ontario Tech. And as a part of that role, I am able to co-facilitate co some recovery college courses being held at the university. So it's really interesting to be on the other side of it. So now as a co-facilitator, I find that I'm continuously learning, not only from the new content that is being introduced since it's evolving from the input given, but from the students as well. Every week I learn or try something new and that is because I still have the opportunity to hear the different perspectives offers, offered from the students. 
And even in the first few months that I've been co-facilitating, I already feel like I have personally grown so much. With that, I'm continuously developing and improving my skill set. I find that I'm doing a lot more than I would have originally done. And I have things, I'm doing things that would have been out of my comfort zone a year ago. If someone asked me to, if I wanted to voluntarily give a presentation like this in a heartbeat, I would have said no. <laughs> no questions asked. Instead, I was actually really excited to do it. And I'm actually looking for opportunities, which is really surprising to me. Um, not only that, I'm developing the social skills that I had difficulties with. And I'm interacting with students and I'm creating connections within my community, all at which at one point I would thought that has been impossible. So to conclude my story, I, I don't think I would be where I am today if it wasn't for the Recovery College. It has had such a substantial impact on me in so, so many different ways. This program was essentially the stepping stone to me becoming the person that I want to be. And I feel like I'm on a much better path than I was a year ago. And I really hope that my story in, illustrates how important and how impactful this program can be to students. So thank you all for listening. Um, I can pass it back to Holly. Thank you, Holly. That was amazing, as always. I'm just so honored to know you and be your partner in this. Um, it's been such an amazing journey with you. Um, and I'm just so proud. And your voice has been so prominent in this movement and advocating for the student voice and creating these spaces where, like, we as students can recognize that we're not alone. And I love what you said about the fact that we're continuously learning. Like, yes, we facilitate the courses, but like in our, in our groups, like our students are teachers too. Like they teach us things all of the time, which is so awesome. So um, really it's for, for us, like it's just such an opportunity to engage with our communities. Um, so I'm just so lucky to know you and work with you. So, and thank you for articulating that so beautifully. Like you, like, you encompassed everything that this is. And um, I just really thank you. Um, I'm just so thrilled to be able to be part of this movement to progress this with people like Hallie and Bonnie and Julia. And um, we're really excited. So Ontario Shores um, dedicated some resources earlier this year and they said, okay, like we'll give it two years, see how it goes. And stories like Hallie's um, have made people realize that this is necessary. And Ontario Shores has now dedicated permanent resources to this initiative. They see it as worth doing. This, this isn't ending. This is only beginning. So that's really, really exciting. So we're looking um, how we can reach more students and really blow this program programming up um, and really doing some awesome thought leadership with students, um, with student voices at the center of it to figure out how we can progress this movement forward in a way that is really uh, relevant and impactful to students while still staying true to the reason why we're doing this. And the reason we're doing this, and Julie and I say it all the time, is our heart's work. Like this is, this isn't just um, a project. This is our heart's work. So we're just really lucky to be able to do that. Um, we would love to chat with you. If you have any questions about the Recovery College, we only had an hour today. We could talk about this all day. So if anyone wants to talk more, like please reach out to us. Our contact information is there. Um, and I just want to thank you all. Is there anything any of you want to add before we open it up for questions? Okay, let's open it up then. Fantastic. Amazing. Thank you all so, so much for that fantastic presentation. I feel like um, there was so much content in there and so many stories, which I agree stories really are the best way to, to talk about this work. Um, so we do have one question in our Q&A, so we'll start with that. Um, and a reminder to everybody else, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question we have here is um, from attendee Leo, who says, um, do the students collectively have a safe place to land and attend addiction recovery meetings? So similar to AA or CA or NA. I can uh, speak to this in the context of the Recovery College, and then I'll turn it over to you, Bonnie. Um, specific to the Recovery College, Recovery College is more um, about wellness in general, and the topics are um, defined by students. So students 
dictate every single thing we talk about in the recovery college. Um, this hasn't necessarily come up. Um, healthy coping strategies and things like that have and wellness planning and all of those things, which I think would be applicable in that space as well. But the, at this point, there are no courses specific to addiction, I would say. And I just wonder if I can toss it over to Bonnie to see if there's any other resources available at, at the school that would meet that need. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, so we at Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, we don't have, uh, to my knowledge, with student mental health services, we don't have AA or um, uh, CANA meetings on campus. Um, there are a ton of like student union groups that like hundreds that I can't possibly know all of those, uh, but through student mental health services, we don't, but we always um, consider the community resources as an extension of the services that we offer. So we're always open to providing a warm introduction or warm handover to any community resources that a student would find helpful. So I would say by extension, we could offer, but directly at the university, not to my knowledge. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I hope Leila, that answers your question. And um, this uh, attendee also was hoping to get connected to you folks. So I will, I think, direct them to the contact information that was posted earlier. Um, we have a couple more questions that have come in now. So um, this question uh, from attendee Patty, uh, how many sessions in is one course? Do you find a drop off from registration to actual attendance? And also, do you have the same number of students who attend follow up sessions? Good question. So typically, um, recovery college courses, the length and timing and everything about it is dictated by the students. Students typically, it could be like a one day workshop if they wanted that, but typically courses range between four and eight weeks, um, about an hour a week and the students decide the time typically early evening is typically best for students is what we've noticed in the in the middle of the week. Um, to get through that hump day uh, little piece. Um, so that's really lovely. In terms of um, the registration and actual attendance, there is, um, attendance is, it um, differs, but one thing that I really wanna highlight is yes, there's impact of bums and seats in those conversations, which is great. But as Julia mentioned, like all the students receive the materials regardless of if they attend the session. So um, there are multiple means of engagement. So yes, students are coming, students are attending. We're having really awesome conversations, but if students are missing courses, that's totally fine. They can still engage with the material um, and they obviously get things out of it like teaching their daughter and taking this um, information. And one of the things we're exploring uh, going forward is the opportunity to have a repository of these course materials and discussion boards so people can access them asynchronously and have those discussions. So that is something that we're um, looking into, but really one of the things I love about the Recovery College is there's multiple means of engagement where students can engage in the way that they want to, to get what they want out of it, which is really wonderful. Did I miss a part of that question? Let me just look. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, was there anything I missed there? Um, I, I think the only question, other part of that was, do you have the same number of students who attend follow-up sessions? Yeah, actually, Bonnie and I just talked about this this morning. Typically, it's pretty steady. Like the people who come once, I often find are kind of hooked and keep coming week after week. Um, so yeah, it's really, really awesome. Great, amazing. We've got even more questions coming in here. Um, where do you start if students are interested in opening a recovery college on their campus? A fantastic question. Uh, I think, oh, um, I think that we're actually um, having some really preliminary conversations with student groups at some other schools who are interested. And I love when student groups approach us, um, which is really wonderful. Um, we, we meet with them and we tell them a little bit about this movement and where we're at. And we really find those natural synergies of the ways that we can support their vision. Um, and so really where we would start is just having a conversation, a coffee chat, understanding what their goals are, where the needs are, and then really implementing that process. Um, we kind of have a really awesome recipe that's been really successful with that chart, with the needs assessment, the co-design, the peer facilitation, all of those things. Um, so that's where we would start, I would say, and really walk them through that process. We're also exploring the opportunity of creating a toolkit that we can give to campuses that basically lays out the recipe for success in this space. Um, so we're really looking forward to that as well. Fantastic. 
any any other people want to jump in on that one um please feel free if anybody wants to jump in um i think those are the the big questions that we have we have a couple of comments here um this one from uh, attendee Jackie, uh, who says that they'd never heard of the recovery college before uh, until they got into doing groups and this course has had a big impact. Um, uh, they're looking into getting into peer support and really want to get um, into it the more and more that they learn. Um, so that sounds really fascinating. Um, I also have a couple other um, comments here, uh, one being that Hallie, you're going to be a star in HR, which I think uh, I can agree on that one. Um, and also one of the attendees was hoping that you could put up actually that um, word cloud that you had put up earlier. And I, I agree, that was a really fantastic word cloud. It gave us so much info on what recovery really means to these folks. Um, fantastic. That's a really great word cloud. Um, I have a couple other questions that uh, that we've come up with just to to sort of set people off, give people some ideas. Um, one question that we had for you was, what are some of the misconceptions around recovery colleges? Do you want to take that, Jules? Yeah, and if you want to add to it, my initial thought, um, a lot of the times, you know, like I said before, it's meant to complement traditional um, clinical treatments for mental distress. Um, it's not meant to replace. And I think that's one big misconception. Um, if you think of like a stepped care model from like lower intensity to higher intensity, recovery college is kind of within the middle section, I would say like a five or a six. Um, it's really like Holly said, a proactive step to wellness and things like that. Um, it's not replacing clinical or more, more intensive treatments of mental distress, I think is one misconception. I'm not sure, Holly, if you have any others that you want to add. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that, um, so we, we've been talking a lot about the Recovery College as a system disruptor. And often the inclination is that people like this will meet the need and they'll be less likely to um, access mental health services as a result of engaging in the programming. And yes, for some that is true, that Recovery College meets the need that they're looking for out of um, other um, avenues and it meets the need. But in other cases, we've heard from students that it actually makes them more likely to seek out support because they have the language and are empowered to articulate um, the experiences they're going to, they know their needs, they know what they need better, and they know how to advocate for themselves. They're empowered to seek out the support that they need. And they recognize, like Hallie mentioned, that seeking out support is not a source of shame. It's actually indicated, indicative of strength. Um, and one thing we really drive home in the recovery college is um, you're not alone. And these experiences are not sources of shame. Um, and you don't, recovery doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like you can do it with other people. It does take a village. Um, other misconceptions uh, that we do a lot, often the word recovery trips people up because they're like, I don't have anything to recover from or anything like that. But again, we just really highlight it's about living a purposeful, meaningful life, which is important to everyone. Um, you don't have to have a diagnosis. You can have a diagnosis. You can have any diagnosis. This programming is applicable to everyone. Um, the other word, especially with students, when I say college or education, they're like, they run for the health, like, I don't want any more school. But um, what we really try to drive home is that this, this education is, it's community based. So it's not us lecturing you, it's us creating a space where we can learn from each other. Um, it's very activity based, it's discussion based, like there's very little of the lecturing piece. We, we do offer some structured curriculum based on the things that students want to learn about but most of it's activity and discussion based. So those are, I would say the most common misconceptions and we do have to do a little bit of myth busting. Fantastic, yeah. I think myth busting is, is sometimes one of the, the biggest parts of the work for sure. Um, we have a, also just a small suggestion to add empathy to this uh, feeling, to this sub word cloud, which I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I have one other question for you folks, which is, um, what what has COVID uh, or the impact of COVID looked like for you folks? I know the original plan was to present the, the courses in person. Uh, I was looking back at the original planning before this webinar, just with the ideas and to bring the peer support, uh, Holly and Julia, like to our campuses and to run these courses. And there was a bit of a budget for transportation. And of course, all of that with COVID um, went. 
So I think it's just, you know, we, we have to see the silver lining and just how much more accessible online offerings have made these types, any mental health supports really that people don't have to um, get out of the house. If they're having a hard time getting out of the house, they're having a hard time getting out of bed. You know, these courses like Recovery College, we have, you know, other mental health services and groups that the online offerings can actually increase accessibility and make it more, um, yeah, you know, just more accessible to folks who are having perhaps a bad day or finding it hard to get. I think that was your question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> answers that. Yeah. Um, fantastic. I have one uh, more question from an attendee here, which is, uh, is there standardization around course development across recovery colleges? It's a really interesting question. Um, so there is some standardization in terms of our process of co-design, but we are really, we recognize that each institution has different structures and cultures and climates. And we really, we, we pitch the model that's been working, but we really can tweak and tailor it to meet the needs of various schools. And in terms of standardization, um, the students at each specific school dictate the offerings at their school. Um, so not really standardization, but we do see common themes coming out like so McMaster students, um, they wanted a life hacks course where you learn about those things that are um, you're expecting to know as a young adult, but never taught. And this discrepancy between what you're expected to know and what you feel prepared to do can be really distressing. Like how many times are you like, dang, I wish I learned that in high school. And like that theme comes up a lot. Um, but the way it is at different schools is different. So for example, some schools in that life hacks type of course might want to learn about finances. Um, some people might want to learn about advocacy. So there's intricacies that make it different at each school. And what's really interesting is um, it's meant to complement existing programming. So maybe one school has a really robust uh, financial advising department, and maybe they don't want to focus as much in the recovery college on finances. So really the courses are amazing because they can fill those gaps, which is awesome. Anybody else have any comments on that? I was muted. I would just say that the yeah, the just to echo what what Holly was saying that the the standardization or the consistent uh, uh, theme is this collaborative approach and really listening carefully. I think it's I hope and think it's contagious to really be listening carefully to the needs of whatever client base, you know, we have, because the services are for them. It's not, they're not for us as service providers, the, the services are for the students. And so what I, you know, the theme I think across, or the standard theme across all of the courses is, is that really close listening and collaborative approach and uh, meeting the needs really of this time, this place of what's going on. So it's not quite typical, uh, what do you call it, standard standardization, but I think it's a standard approach, which is really inspiring. Fantastic. All right. Well, with that, oh, we have maybe one more question. Never mind. I answered that question. So with that, um, I'm going to say uh, thank you so, so much to our panelists who came in and shared with us today about the recovery college model. I feel like I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody here learned so much. Uh, and um, yeah, if you would like to contact our panelists for more, um, I hope that you took down their contact information. Um, please look out for a survey that we're going to be sending out afterwards uh, to let us know how this webinar was for you. Uh, and with that, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye.